grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd like to tell you a little bit about a piece of Las Vegas legend. You see, for many years, my, uh, my friends and my wife and I, when we would go to Vegas, we would go down to the MGM Grand. And it's not just because they had those big cats and I love kitties. They had a, a slot machine. And it was truly one of a kind. It was called the Lion's Share. And it had been in the Las Vegas MGM Grand for almost 20 years, never paying out its jackpot. Now, if you, if you watch movies, one that I particularly enjoy is Vegas Vacation with the Griswolds. And at one point, they're walking through the gaming floor of the MGM Grand, and you can see in the background the lion's share. This was back in 1996 when they filmed it. There was a whole bank of them. And according to law, you can't retire slot machines until they've paid out. Well, that was back in the day when you put a coin in, you pull the arm, and you actually got real coins out the bottom. Well, this one-of-a-kind slot machine was one of those left over. MGM had changed all the other machines, and that bank of lion's share machines became just one. You couldn't put a coin in anymore. You had to give it paper. And if you did happen to win... You didn't get a coin out, you got a little piece of paper. Well, back in 2014, that jackpot was struck. After 20 years, a retired couple traveling in Las Vegas after five minutes won that jackpot. I can't tell you how many hours I and my wife and my friends, over several trips, mind you, spent waiting for those kitties to show up on that wind line. Well, there was one particular time when we were playing this machine, and normally we did it for fun. But this time, I was doing it with a little more seriousness. I wanted to win that jackpot, and I felt that I needed to win that jackpot. Now, I had some, some consumer debt, and quite frankly, for many years, I felt as if all of my money went to rent, to food, and to paying off those credit cards. And so when I was playing that slot machine, it was not for entertainment, but I was making it the thing that I put my faith and my trust in. It really became at that point in time for me a first commandment issue, that you shall have no other gods. And yet, when we were playing that slot machine and pulling that handle, what was I doing? I was praying to that lion's share to give me the three cats, that we could win that jackpot. And then everything in my life would be better. Well, as I said, that was a first commandment issue. For what is the first commandment? That you shall have no other gods. And what does this mean? That we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Trust in God because he knows what's best for you, because he knows what you need. And sometimes what you need is not what you want. As the author of Hebrews introduces us here, he says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. He tells us what it is to live by faith. And he gives us several examples. 
By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs by faith of the same promise. And by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive. By faith. These Old Testament saints lived by faith. They lived in the assurance of things hoped for and yet not seen. As Hebrews says, these all died in faith not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. Faith fears, loves, and trusts in God above all things, even when, even when we don't have the thing promised, but only greeted and seen from afar. In the, in the words of Christ today, we are being exhorted to faith, exhorted to live in fear, love, and trust in God. For he says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food and more than clothing. It's more than the things of this world. It's more than the things that we can see. Because we are not only a body, but we are a soul. And that cannot be seen. It cannot be touched. But we know it's present. We know it is here. And there are needs of the body but there are also needs of the soul. And our Lord provides for these things. He says, consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Or consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Even, even the wildflower in the field, God has given great beauty to. More beauty than Solomon himself. And what is the ultimate destiny of these field grasses? Well, in that region of the world, trees are very scarce. And so in place of the wood that might be used for a fire, the grass of the field, these beautiful lilies, are gathered together, tied up tightly, and they are burned in the fire, burned in the place of the wood that's not there. Even this beauty is fleeting. Are you of not more value than these ravens or these lilies? And what, of course, what, of course, is the answer? Yes. Yes, you are of infinite value. You, brother and sisters, you are human beings. You are the pinnacle of creation. You are the penultimate act before that seventh day of rest. And unlike every other created thing that was created by the Word of God, let there be light, let the seas break apart, let there be trees, let there be animals, let there be birds. You, you were formed not by the word, 
but by the very own hands of God. God stuck his hand into the dirt to form your body and then pressed his lips to breathe life into humanity. Yes, the birds, yes, the lilies are wonderful creations, but you are distinctly different, formed by God's own hand in his own image and likeness and given his breath. And that is why that is why he says you're not to seek what you eat or what you drink or to be worried. For the nations of the world, the unbelievers, the pagans, they all seek after these things, as do you, and your Father knows that you have need of them. So think now of, of the Lord's Prayer. When we say in the fourth petition, give us this day our daily bread. And what is it that daily bread includes? But everything, as Luther says, everything that has to do with the needs of this body and life. And in true Luther fashion, we get a laundry list of things, such as food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, land, animals, money, goods, a devout husband and wife, devout children, devout workers, devout and faithful rulers, good government, good weather, peace, health, self-control, good reputation, good friends, faithful neighbors, and the like, which is to say, and on and on and on. Your Father knows that you need these things, and He gives them to you, and He also gives them to all people, even wicked, evil people. But in the fourth petition, we pray that we would come to realize that he is the giver of these good gifts and receive them with thanksgiving and to trust in our Father that he will give these things to us as he has, as he'll continue to do. But in the fallen world, things don't always work as they should and there are distractions, things that take us away from fearing loving, or trusting in God. You might say to me, Pastor, there are times that I have been hungry or there are times that I have been afraid I have not had a home. You can't tell me that at those times I should have just shut up and trusted in God. Well, you should have trusted in God. I've been there myself with great fear and what did I do? I did not trust in God. But these, these are real problems, though. Problems of hunger and homelessness. Problems of isolation. And what is it that we do? Well, this is a joyous task that's given to the church. For the church is one of the means by which God helps all creation. The joy of the church is that we have been given a treasure, and that treasure are those in need, that we may give to them the good news of the gospel, the good news of Christ. But before the soul can hear this good news, we must quiet the cries of the body. And so that is why we work in our communities to feed the hungry, to shelter the homeless, why we give alms, why we volunteer our time. These are, these are the money bags that do not wear out. They are the good works that the Holy Spirit has given us to do to further the kingdom here on earth. As James tells us, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? We as the church care for the body so that we as the church may care for the soul. For everyone who has been given much, of him much will be required. And indeed, we have been given much, 
we have been given the kingdom. For as he says, fear not, little flock, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And truly, it is God-pleasing that you should be his children, to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ in your baptism, and then filled with him in the holy sacrament of the body and blood. For it is the very first will, or as they, as they say in the Latin, the voluntas antecedents, the first will, that he earnestly desires the salvation of all sinners. But it is only the second will, the voluntas consequens, that he judges and condemns those who reject grace in Christ Jesus. Now the Old Testament saints had been given a great gift, but they saw it from afar. They died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from far away. We, however, do not see them from far away. We have the kingdom here and now. It was inaugurated on the cross when Christ died, when he began to reconcile the whole world unto himself, and unto God the Father. And there is a fullness that is yet to come. This kingdom of God that is yours is here and now, but yet still more is there. And we have that foretaste, that foretaste of the fullness of the kingdom in the body and blood of Christ. A foretaste of the feast that is to come. And so you, children of God, you are full heirs of this kingdom. And it is your Father's good pleasure to care for you, to give you all things that are necessary, not necessarily the things you want, but the things that you need. And in times of need, it is your great pleasure as the people of God to give of your excess, to care for those in need, that they also may hear and be healed in the soul once the cries of the body are quieted. And so I, as, as with Christ, exhort you to live by faith, to live in the fear, the love, and the trust of God our Father, and do not be anxious about anything, Do not be anxious, but in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, for it is very good pleasure. It is the very favorite thing he loves to do, to give to you, to care for you, as you are his very own child. And so may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And may you also rejoice this day in receiving his body and his blood for the nourishment of your body and the nourishment of your soul. Amen.